Whenever you want to, because I know we have people who are standing by. Yeah, yes, I know a lot of people are going to just kind of come, come and go. Yeah. Yep, that's exactly fair. But I'll do a quick one. I'll do a quick welcome for those that are here and a welcome to those that are on the line. Let me make sure that. Oh, yeah, it's Ray. Yeah. It's Ray. It's Ray. <laughs> it's our first time doing the virtual, so it's, it's Ray. Ray. It's great. <laughs> I um, just want to let people know that we are a news and new bookstore uh, for indie reads because a lot of people don't realize that one in six adults can't read at the fifth grade uh, level. So all of the money we raise here at the bookstore goes directly to empower our adults and their families through English literacy. And so your purchases, your donations, volunteers, all of that goes to serve our 200 students that we currently have in programming. Um, so if you weren't able to register on Eventbrite, please stop by the cash register. I have little um, forms here, just a quick name, how many is in your party and your email, just so we can keep track of who came today. Um, let's see, with that, we're just excited to uh, host the brightest star here. James Moorhead uh, was introduced into the world of theater at M.H. Carroll High School in Monroe, Louisiana, at the age of 14. He was at Grambling State, is that correct? Right. Lovely, Grambling State University. He was awarded Best Actor three times, and also won the award of Outstanding Senior in Theater. He is a retired professor of speech and theater at Anderson University, where he taught thousands of students for over 30 years. And he is the pastor of Pasadena Heights Church of God, serving with his wife, Jean Moorhead, here in Indianapolis. His daughter, Andrea Moorhead Allen, is a seven-time Emmy Award-winning journalist and formerly worked as a news anchor in Indianapolis, Grand Rapids, Michigan, and Worcester, Massachusetts. She has covered major events over her 30 year career, including the 2000 Summer Olympics in Sydney, the 2002 Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City, and the 2009 inauguration of US President Barack Obama. She's a breast cancer survivor, wife, and mother of 14 year old, is it Ian James? Yes. Ian James Allen. She's excited about her new journey as a voiceover talent, television host, public speaker, executive producer, and children's book author. And this is her first of many, we hope, to more to come. Yes, so with so that, let's welcome James Andrew. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, you know, it's a beautiful day. We had sun or snow the other night, and I'm so excited to see that it's now beautiful. The sun is out, and so it's a great day to be out and about. Um, thank you all again for being here. This has been a truly a labor of love. Um, you know, sitting here looking at how far we've come, I think it's been about a year or so that we've been working on this book. Um, to see it come to fruition is truly a blessing. Um, being here for me is a sense of freedom, a sense of peace, a sense of you know dreams coming to fruition. And that's what we want to help our kids. We want to inspire our kids to have big dreams and to dream dreams that may seem impossible, but knowing that with God, all things are possible. In life. Yes. Yeah. The idea of a children's book was not the first idea. I started off writing my autobiography. And we were down in Florida on vacation one year, and I shared one of the chapters with my family. And they were interested, excited about it. And they kept wondering, when are you going to finish? And I said, yeah, in time, it's going to happen. <laughs> well, in time, it turned out to be almost three years, and I'm still working on it. But in the meantime, Andrea came to me one day and said, Dad, have you ever thought about maybe a children's book? And I said, well, I'm open to anything at this point because I'm not finished with anything. And so she pitched the idea and I loved it. My wife loved it. And the rest is history. And here we are. Here we are. <laughs> here we are. Are there, I know, Kat, we have some people who might be watching. Any questions that any of them have sent our way so far before we open it up to Q&A here? Not yet. Not yet? Okay. Are there any questions before we do a little quick reading of the book and talk about our experience? I know. Cameron's read the book. Oh, okay. Good. Good. <laughs> He's had a chance to read it. Oh, all right. So are there any questions? What do you think about in terms of our experience just writing the book together? It was a, it was a label of love. I, I could not have selected a better person to act as co-writer, publicist, 
information person, and on and on and on. But then my daughter, she's a triple threat as it relates to <laughs> communication. And so I put it completely in her hands. I shared the story, and it was my story that came to life in her handwriting. And it was a beautiful experience. You know, as we have been doing a lot of inter interviews with um, newspapers and even some TV here locally and around the nation, you know, one of the things that we have, have spoken about that we believe and hope that people take from the book is that, you know, humanity is, God has created all of us. And, um, you know, we believe that children at an early age learn how to be kind and respectful, to love one another, and for us all to recognize and realize that our differences actually make us better. And God created all of us. He created differences. And that if all of us would learn to love each other, be kind to one another, I truly believe that the issues and the problems that we have in this world wouldn't exist. It wouldn't exist. I mean, it's, to me, it seems so simple and easy. But why do we as human beings make it so difficult sometimes when it doesn't have to be that way? If we start from a spirit and from a place of love, beautiful things can arise from that. We learn about other people, learn about ourselves. Um, you know, that's what it's all about. It's about embracing our differences and realizing that at the end of the day, we really have more similarities than we do differences. Absolutely. The idea of the book took me back and I had to relive a lot of the pains, a lot of the anguishes, a lot of the embarrassment, a sense of shame, and even the word albino was difficult for me to comprehend and to even fathom for a number of years. And so as uh, time progressed, I moved beyond that point. I began to accept myself for who I was, who I am, and who I hope to be, if God continues to allow me to live. And the idea was that I could not tolerate hearing the word. I could not tolerate seeing the word because when I was growing up in the South back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, I didn't see anyone else like myself. And as I have said many times in speeches, etc., I was too white to be black and too black to be white. And so as a result, I was sort of in the middle. And I didn't know for a long time what I was. People would ask me, who, who, who are you? And I, I would tell them, when I went to Anderson University as a professor, one of the things that I told my classes at the very beginning, uh, two things I don't want you to pay too much attention to. Number one, my voice. I can be intimidating when I get excited, and I don't ever intend to be intimidating, and my color, or lack of it. I said, I am here to teach, you're here to learn, but we will be learners together, and that I'm a teacher of life, not just communication and theater. And it worked for me for 32 years. I retired in 2016. But it has been a long, long journey, a journey of explaining who I am, what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, and on and on and on. As time progressed and as we moved toward an integrated society, a segregated society, then it was not so much of a struggle for me because then I began to sort of blend in, which was never the case when I was growing up. Now, I graduated from high school and went to Grambling State University in 1964. And the thing that was interesting about going to Grambling is that it was a segregated institution primarily for African-American people. But the unique aspect of Grambling was that it was like a melting pot because there were kids on campus who looked more white than they did black, mulattoes and octagons. So I sort of fell in there somewhere in the middle, and I was in the middle of two ends. And so it was less complicated for me to struggle in that environment than it had been before. The other piece that was salvation for me was theater. Put me on a wig put makeup on my face, <laughs> put gloves on my hands, and I was where I thought I should be. And whenever I was performing, I shed off who I was. And it was amazing that when 
two and a half hours passed. If it was a William Shakespeare's play, uh, Shakespeare had no sense of brevity. So the play could go on for four hours. But at the end of the play, and the applause ended, and I had to take up my own character. But I learned to maneuver between those two. So I reached a point where I have learned to accept myself. I've learned to appreciate others. I've learned to understand how important it is to be uh, sensitive, how important it is to be compassionate. And so it has been a long journey, but it's been a good journey. When I think about my journey as a journalist, um, gosh, I've been kind of when you say 30 years, it's like 30 years, but yeah, it's been over 30 years. And I have, as Kat mentioned in the very beginning, I've interviewed presidents, um, I've interviewed you know, heads of state. I mean, I have done it all. And I never thought that, you know, people ask me all the time, well, what's your best story? What's your most favorite story um, in your career? And I've always would have a difficult time telling people because I've always said, and my mom and dad have always taught me that everyone has a story. Everyone's story is important. Mm -hmm. No one story is better than anyone else's, that we all have purpose in life, mm -hmm. that God has created all, each and every one of us to have purpose. And so I never could really answer that. So I would say sometimes like, you know, well, Barack Obama, I mean, you know, that's great, he's the president, I got to go to the inauguration. I mean, you know, that was a, a wonderful, wonderful experience um, that I could look back at pictures and go, wow, I actually met and interviewed a president and the first lady, not one time, but several times over, and I have the pictures to prove it. <laughs> but when I think about the most important story now, it's this story. It's my story. You know, in the journalism business, we're told not to be the story. We can't be the story. We're supposed to tell other people's stories, to not put ourselves in the story, to not talk about our feelings and what we feel and our emotions, and, the, and that's true. That's part of the journalistic creed. However, now I'm in a place in my life where I can talk about what's important to me. I have a voice that no one owns. I can write about what I like. And this story is perhaps now the most important story that I've ever had in my career, which is my dad's story, my story. And so I hope that you know you all walk away knowing that each and every one of you have a story, whether it's written in a children's book or a nonfiction or a fiction or whatever it is. It's to embrace who you are, embrace your story, and know that whatever you've been through in life can help someone else. And that it's important for you to share your story, to talk about it. And that's been such a wonderful experience for us, being able to share our story. You know, I've never really ever talked about my father being an albino because it's just my dad. I mean, what, you know, I don't give people self, explain to people, hey, when you meet my dad, he's gonna look a little different. Right? Who does that? Um, but, you know, I could tell that people would ask me afterwards, like, is he that white? <laughs> and then I would explain it. And so I know that there are questions, there are people who are curious, who haven't maybe seen an albino, or they, if they do, they're wondering, ooh, who, you know, what, how does that, they're curious, basically. Mm -hmm. And so we hope that this book helps to explain to people of all ages. You know, a lot of times in the TV business, we, and even in, in entertainment, there's there, um, TV shows or films, and they might mention about an albino, like, oh my God, did you see that albino rat? Or did you see that albino snake? And it always has hurt me because the way that the audience views it, they see it as something funny and odd. And I would think to myself, well, that's not what I think of my dad. And so I will tell people, that's not funny. I've said that in newsrooms before, even the one that I used to work in. That's not a funny story, we shouldn't hear that. And so for me, representation matters. This is a time in the world where all of us should be willing to be our true authentic selves and to explain to people that I might look a little different, I might be a little different. I, whatever it is, whatever the differences are, that that's okay, and that's what God, God made me this way, and I'm confident, and I feel assured in myself, and I can, persevere and I can win against whatever the odds are, the mountains that are placed before me. And so that, this is my father's life, this is my life, this is our life, and so we're excited to be able to share it to the masses. Um, it's been well received, and as you can imagine, we just, you know, the book was just published um, last month, so we're in the very beginnings of this. We're excited about going back to Louisiana to his high school to speak to kids there, and across the state of Louisiana, and worked, um, talked with him in Shreveport in New Orleans, and in Generette, 
And so we're excited about what this book really encompasses. Um, the forward, you'll see, was written by a man by the name of Marvin Jones III. He is an actor on the CW TV series, Black Lightning. He too is also an albino. And so I thought, what better person for us to reach out to to see if he would be willing to write a forward? Because so many times this topic, people just don't discuss it. And so he, he jumped on board and said, I would be honored to write it. I would be honored to be a part of this. And so I know for my father, as we were watching um, Marvin, you know, my dad wanted to be on Broadway. He wanted to be the actor that you see in film and on television. And that didn't happen. But we see Marvin as an example of what of my dad's dream, an extension of my father's dream, that he didn't exactly accomplish that. But others are, because the times are different. And so we're just excited and thrilled that he was part of, of this book as well. Some of the questions that uh, I have been asked over the years, well, with albinism, what, what are the, quote, handicaps? I, I don't like to use the word handicap, but that's what I often heard. Or disability. Or disability. Mm -hmm. And beside a lack of pigmentation, visually, light, I'm very sensitive to light. And I've been sensitive to light all of my life. I'm sensitive to the sun. I try to stay out of the sun. One of the things my stepfather said to me when I graduated from high school, he said, James, now that you've graduated from high school, one day all of this is going to belong to you. And I looked around, and that was 13 acres of land. We had a goat, a couple of mules. We had a three-bedroom house with 10 people that lived in it. And he was a farmer. And he thought that I should be a farmer. And I knew that I could not stand that son. And I said, Dad, thank you for your years of experience, et cetera. I said, but I think I'd better go to college. And so that's exactly what happened. Um, the thing that I discovered that was so interesting is that I limited myself until one day when I was in the fourth grade, I was sitting outside of a classroom because we had no, um, I had no friends. Uh, there was one young man that became a very good friend of mine and he contacted you, I believe, a couple of weeks ago and said, James was my very first friend. My but, true friend. My true friend. But the thing that was so interesting was these teachers were sitting inside having their lunch and they were talking. And my name came up. And I remember one of the teachers saying, that little Moorhead boy, he has so many strikes against him. I don't think he's ever going to make it in this world. He said, I don't think he's ever going to graduate from elementary school. And I sat on those steps in tears began to form in my heart and in my eyes. And I heard a voice. And the voice said to me, I created you. And I don't create junk. And that was the beginning. It was a long and tedious process. But I began to feel like someone cared about me. The other person that was very influential in my life was my uncle. Now, in the book, He's called Uncle Tom. It's so ironic because that was a nickname. And in the South, Uncle Tom was just a negative term, period. But he was more than just a name to me. He was a father I never knew. I was born out of wedlock. And I believe to a great extent that my mother carried both the love for me, but also the shame of the sin that she had committed. But God is so good, friends. And one of the things that I've come to realize is that I am special. I met an African young man one night. He came into our church and he was intoxicated and he wanted to be anointed. And he said to me, you know, you're one of the rainbow children. And I thought, I've never heard that expression before. <laughs> but in the truest sense of the word, a rainbow is a mixture of many colors. And so with that idea in mind, that I believe I was special, that God had created me for a special purpose. And whereas I used to sit in the back of the classroom from first grade up through high school, and 
I was ashamed to tell the teacher that I could not see the chalkboards. And it was amazing, and I'm so thankful for in that day and time, writing was a lot larger on the print. They weren't concerned about how many pages, et cetera. So I discovered that all I needed to do was to hold the book close to me, and I could see it. The other piece that I am I'm so thankful for was that I had a good mind to remember. And I remember so vividly, we got books in the second grade, and I could not really see the pages because my parents couldn't afford glasses for me. And I remember so vividly that I would sit there and listen as the other students would read. And we had a book called On Cherry Street. And on Cherry Street, it was see Tom, see Betty, see Susan, see Flip. Well, I couldn't see it on the page, but I remembered it. Yeah. So when she came to me and she said, James Otis, that was what people called me, it's your time to read. See Tom, see Betty, see Susan, see Flip, run Tom, run Betty, run Susan, run, run Flip. And so she thought that this kid is accelerating just didn't know that it was my ability to remember. And it was that mindset that God had given me that helped me through high school when I would participate in plays rather than to have the script in front of me. I always memorized my line. And many times I had a lot of lines. And as a result, the other students would be upset because I would be the only one on stage without a script. But that was my defense. So that's just a small portion of my story. I could keep you here all evening, <laughs> but uh, I know you have other things to do. But I have learned to adjust, and I've learned to appreciate what God has done in my life. Never in my wildest did I ever think that I would stand before thousands of people and speak when I was ashamed to be in front of 10 people. But that self-esteem piece has come out, and I'm thankful. I'm 75 years old, and I'm thankful to this day that God created me the way he created me. I used to say to him, if you're truly God, this is when I was much younger, I would say, if you're truly God, I want you to change me. When I go to bed tonight and I wake up tomorrow morning, I want to be as black as those shoes that are under my bed. <laughs> well, I'd wake up the next morning and I'd ease my hands from under the covers, and nothing would have changed tears would come into my eyes, but I discovered something, that God was changing me from the inside. Yes. And that's the best way to be changed, yes. is from the inside. Yes. And so now I don't wake up and look and say, oh, you're still the same. Oh, there's some wrinkles. <laughs> <laughs> We're not there. But beyond that, I am thankful to be where I am. I'm thankful for having a story. I'm thankful that my daughters never, ever felt ashamed of me. I'm thankful for the woman that God gave me. My wife is here. I don't know exactly where she is. She is. <laughs> uh, and I'm so thankful. And I'll just share this. I don't know how much time we have, but um, one thing that I am so thankful for is that God gave me a wife and gave me two beautiful children. When we were at Grambling and we were in the same department theater, I fell in love with her long before she fell in love with me. She wanted to marry a preacher. <laughs> and I had no desire to be a preacher. But I remember so vividly that I had the patience of Job. And I, I wanted her as my wife. And I remember we would walk, uh, especially on special occasions we had on Sundays, programs called Lyceum. And I remember so vividly walking hand in hand with her and some of the guys that lived in the resident hall where I lived used to say to me, Moorhead, what is it about you that would cause you to get one of those most beautiful girls on campus? And my reply always was, us, because I'm special. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm special to have uh, been a husband and a father for many, many years. Uh, when we went Grambling, there was an elderly lady that was, uh, she was in charge of, of waitressing in this little cafe there. And I remember one time she came over to our table and she said to us, you know, you all are gonna have some beautiful children. <laughs> she never lived to see that. But I believe in my heart of hearts, she knows. Mm -hmm. And that was a prophecy. So I'm thankful. Amen. I think that's the best thing that I can say. I'm thankful for the life that I've lived. 
And I don't mean to be boastful or anything, but I would not change it for anything in the world. God bless you. <laughs> Q&A before we do a, a book reading. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I have a question. I have a friend who is light-skinned mix, and then she had a son that was in grade school, and, and the struggle was kids would say, well, that's not your mom, because she doesn't look like you. And then when she got pregnant with her second child, she had to have a conversation with her son, like, we don't know what shade our baby's going to come out looking like, but this is your sister. Did you either one of you have those problems of that's not your dad because he doesn't look like you or being concerned about what your children would look like and the struggles that they would have? You want me to start? Yes, yeah, yeah. um, You know, growing up, and I'm sorry if I'm, if when I talk, I'm quivering because his dad talks, it just makes me so full. Um, growing up, there were people who, friends who would ask me like, well, is your dad white? And as a child, I'll be honest, it was difficult for me to explain it because, I mean, think about, you know, how do you explain to your to your friends what your father is when I just say, well, he's black. That's what my mom and dad told me to tell people that they asked, he's black. But as a five or six or seven year old, I didn't know how to explain what albinism is. And so again, that's the purpose for the books to help explain that. But I, I never felt, as dad even mentioned, you know, I never was ashamed. Um, He's my father. I loved him. And I just let people assume whatever they want to because at the end of the day, I can't change your opinion. Um, all I can do is show you what's most important in life, and that's the love that we share and the support that I get from my mom and my dad. And that's the story. This story isn't about his skin color. The story is about who he is as a person and what he, what his legacy is and what he leaves to people, how he makes people feel. And that's the, that's the, I believe, the purpose for each and every one of us. It's to impart love and kindness to one another. And that is, those are the greatest gifts that we can give each other here. So to answer your question, I know it's kind of a round the way, but I never really dealt with it because it, it just didn't matter to me. And if it didn't matter to me, I hope that it would matter to other people. But I will be honest, um, you know, I never, when I started dating, like in, college and there might be a couple of boyfriends that I would bring home. I never said anything to them in advance. I just said, hey, here's my dad and here's my mom. And I could see a little puzzling, a little quizzical, you know, that they're thinking like, well, what? And it's interesting because we never even had a conversation about that. It just was, it just is my father. Um, when I was pregnant, I never once worried or wondered. I mean, my husband and I talked about it, like, but it wasn't like, oh, you know, what are we going to do? Or I'm nervous or I'm scared. It just is, if that's what God blesses us with, that's what God blesses us with. Because whatever it is, it's a blessing. Girl, boy, albino, non-albino, it doesn't matter. So, no, that was, I mean, and my husband is here and he can speak to that a little bit. If he if he were ever nervous or ever thought about it. Oh, I was nervous, but it wasn't because he was... <laughs> Oh, I'm just nervous because he was your father. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we never we never had a discussion about it. it just, no, we were happy to be pregnant, yeah. which we weren't even supposed to be pregnant. Yeah. We weren't supposed to have children. So we were happy that God blessed us to have a child. And we were just excited to be parents. I mean, that was what was most important in life is for us, that God was blessing us with the, the awesomeness to raise a child. Yes. Yeah. And so it didn't matter. Now, when Ian came out, he was very, very pale. He had black hair, but I wasn't like, oh my God, thank God he's not an albino. Like that just <laughs> never came into my mind. I was just happy he had five toes mm -hmm. and that he was alive and that he was breathing and that he had five fingers. Like it, none of that ever came into my, my thought process. So, no. That, what I was referring to was when I asked Death to marriage. Your hand in marriage. That, that was the only, uh, it never, I mean, I know what he, who he is and his, condi and, and his condition. I know that and when you look at it and you see it, it never ever affected my relationship with him or questions or anything like that. I mean, I've asked him questions about right. challenges, of course, what's in the book. Um, but, you know, he, he's always been bad to me. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
and he can cook, so I'll be. <laughs> and I think for you too, though, you had um, a friend. Who yes, I had. You grew I, up with in Philadelphia. Yes, yes I. In mm -hmm. fact, um, I had a when I moved. I moved from Philadelphia to Reading, Pennsylvania. I'm originally from Philadelphia, but I went there. I moved there to go to junior high school, and the first friend that I met, he's albino. He has albinism. And his name is Darrell Lee, and I actually and he, he we hung out all the time. He was my best friend, first friend when I moved there. And he has a son, and his son has albinism. And so I shared the, the book with them. They he, he he and his son really enjoyed the book. So I've always had that identification because I had experience in the past with someone who dealt with who has albinism. So it wasn't that much of a shock to me. Um, because I had already been exposed to it. Now, everyone doesn't have that opportunity, right. uh, but I did. And I think that that was, that was beneficial to me, just in terms of understanding what it was all about, knowing someone who was affected by it, that it's genetic, you know, it's nothing that their parents did, it's not a sin, they didn't, you know, have. Back in the day, say you sleep with your cousin or something like that, you know, your children would turn out crazy. But you know, whatever. <laughs> but that it was just it was just something a condition that someone was born with, you know, like anything else. Um, so. There are so many stories that uh, I could share. I remember when I was in graduate school at Oklahoma State in Stillwater, Oklahoma. I was in a play and my wife and daughters came to see the play and they were on the front row. I had been out on the stage at least seven times and I remember our youngest daughter, Amy, saying to her mother, I could hear her, and she said, when's daddy coming out, mom? And she had to, he's been out there more than once, honey. So it's just amazing what you can see and what you don't see. And I've learned to see with not just my eyes, but with my heart. There was a young man when uh, we live in Anderson still, even though we pastor a church here. My sister-in-law has a daughter who's also a teacher. They were teaching at the same school. And one evening, Shay came by the house and told us about this young man who was in kindergarten and he was an albino and wanted to know if I would come and visit with him one day and I said sure. So my wife and I went over to the school and we met this young man and it, it was just amazing. I don't know whether it was because of my size or what, but when we walked into the room he stood up and he looked and it was the idea I believe that well, here's someone who looks like me. Here's someone who has done something with his life. Well, the thing that we were very proud of that God could help us do, he needed glasses. And that was something that I could definitely identify with. My wife and I purchased his very first pair of glasses. And Shay and his homeroom teacher said it changed his whole personality to be able to see better. So I think one of the things that we want this book to do is to help people to see better, mm -hmm. to see not with the eyes, but with the heart, with compassion, with empathy, with understanding, that we are like a mosaic. None of us are alike, and it's a good thing that we're not, but we're like a mosaic. When we come together, we should come together as a beautiful mosaic. So that was just one of the many experiences I, I had when I came to Henderson University to uh, actually, I call it audition, I guess you will, for the job that I had for 30 some years. A gentleman who came and picked me up at the airport. He didn't have a sign that said Anderson College. It was Anderson College at the time. Nobody knew what I looked like. They just assumed that I was white because a white friend who had lived in Louisiana, who had moved here to teach at the university, also, uh, they figured that he, because he was white, 
that his friends would be white. Well, we had known this young man for a number of years, and I remember so vividly when we finally got to uh, Decker Hall. He didn't, he ran in ahead of me. He didn't walk in with me behind him or next to him. He ran into the vice president's office and he said, look what I found. Not who I found, look what I found. And so they were all shocked because at that time you didn't put on the application race or anything like that. But it was uh, people getting accustomed to who I was. And I remember walking into the class for the very first time and my students didn't think anything about it. But I always had to explain to them that I am African American and I'm proud of who I am. And to this very moment, friends, I'm proud of who I am. It's not a boastful pride, it's a thankful pride that I have lived a good life, 75 years, and well, here I am with a daughter who loved me enough to say, I want to write a book with you. I want to know about a part of your life that I didn't know of. And so it was a cleansing process, I believe, for both of us. And it has drawn us so much closer as father and daughter. And I guess if I never do anything else in my life that's noteworthy, it's the idea of having two beautiful daughters who affirm me, along with a beautiful wife who affirms me. Those are the best gifts I could ever ask for. <laughs> this has been me for like the last year <laughs> on all aspects from getting the book to look at the illustrations this is like oh. um, that is beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, these are tears of joy <laughs> these are definitely tears of joy any other questions anything Kat? daddy um, would you like to read the passage of the book I would ask if you would Okay. Read a bit of a book. Sure. Uh, you may want to get a different book. That's <laughs> 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 I put marks in that one. That's okay. uh, and I'll explain to you all. I mentioned earlier that one of my uh, handicaps and disabilities is light. And in this room, the light from out there is affecting my vision. So to do the book justice, I would rather have a read. So uh, maybe another time in a different place. Or uh, maybe I could do a scene from a play or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you can act out the book. <laughs> no, 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 this is fine. This is fine. So, um, The Brightest Star by Andrew Moorhead and James Moorhead, illustrated by Stephanie Heider, forward by Marvin Jones III of the CW TV series Black Lightning. What I love about this book is. All of the things were good about humanity. Talking about, as we mentioned earlier, about our differences, but it's really a love story, a love story for self and others. And we wanted this book to also be educational. And so the very first line, so that young people understand that they're not alone, because we, as I mentioned earlier, believe that representation matters. And so we're hoping that other children who are albinos that they will look and say wow there's a book about me there's a book about me there's someone who lived my life who lives my life and there's someone who looks like me so that they feel proud about who they are so we start off with a very simple fact is that one in twenty thousand people in north america and europe are known as an albino here's a clever way to remember how to say it and here goes a guy like me named al said by no means should you be ashamed for a gene in your body did not produce the color of your race. And it's still a blessing that God made you by his saving grace. I have lighter skin that is bright white. As a child, I would be teased. And of course, you know, that is not right. I was called all kinds of names, not James, but words that really hurt. The worst ones were red because the sun would burn my skin all over my body, including my chin. Other names were ghost, 
and Casper, White Boy, Snow Boy, and even Snowflake. It didn't matter what the kids used because all of them made my heart ache almost every day on the playground. I was all alone and bullied by kids screaming, you need to get a tan. Every night I cried myself asleep, hoping that God would help them understand that being different actually made me unique. I had an Uncle Tom, an uncle named Tom, who really believed in me. And he always said, James Otis, you can become whatever you want to be. My hair is golden, like blonde, with highlights that look kissed by the sun. As I've gotten older, it's turned gray, which means I have wisdom, so that's okay. Because God has proven that my outside shell does not tell the full story of how my life was meant to bring him glory. It's very important to speak positive words to yourself, which is part of building up your self-esteem. God placed the right people in my life and became a special part of my team. It hasn't been easy finding true friends, especially the kind who want to see you win. So it never dawned on me that I would ever find my person, fearing there would be toward me an aversion. But God had me at the right place at the right time to meet a beautiful young lady to die. We met in theater class and acted in plays at Grambling State University, where I found other friends who treated me with respect and dignity. After a lot of time courting, I knew Jean stood for all things right, just, and fair. So I asked her to marry me, and she said yes. She was God's answer to my prayer. She's not just my wife, but my best friend, placed in my life for a reason. And for that, I have loved her and always will until the end of our season. Then came our two children, Andrea and me. I taught them that although I'm a different color, my race and culture are black. They have a darker hue and have always had my back. That's what family is all about. No matter our differences, we can all shout about the goodness of God and how he requires all of us to be kind. So here's a little bit more I need to get off my mind. You know, my Uncle Tom was right. You really can be anything you want to be. No matter what anyone says, as long as you believe, you can achieve. I had a dream of becoming a famous actor on Broadway in New York. You know, the city that never sleeps. That didn't happen, but God's promises of purpose he keeps. I still followed my passion and became a college professor of theater and speech. Imagine the kid who didn't like people looking at him that stood in front of thousands of students and teaching them to never fear and project their best and always lean on God for the rest. I often get calls or messages from the students as far back as the 1980s, thanking me for giving them confidence to shine bright. I don't take the credit. Instead, I honor him for being my guiding light. I never thought that I would someday become a preacher Studying God's word, writing sermons, and educating people is another form of a teacher. My favorite scripture is Isaiah 40, 31. It says, They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. The moral of my story is that God has not given us the spirit of ants. Just fly like the eagle with courage and power and do not ever fall prey to being a coward. <laughs> to whom much is given, much is required. I choose joy and not to be mired in negativity, but instead share positivity. Like the young albino in my hometown of Anderson, Indiana. He was sad and sometimes mad about his skin color and not being able to be out in the sun. Well, I told him, you might turn red and get blisters, but you could always count on me as your soul mister who prays for you and with you, because I understand. And like me, you will make it through and become a purposeful man who's chosen to show the world that with God, you can. There are other types of albinos that have skin without color, like snakes, tigers, giraffes, and alligators, all beings great and small. But we want you to know that we all stand proud and tall. 
You may also see us as models and in movies, but we're not a fad and not a trend. Our vinyls are intentionally made and meant to blend with all people of all races to teach understanding, compassion, and acute inclusion when seeing different faces. That's what life is really all about, by accepting others for who they are, a very special part of the universe as their own unique star. This love letter ends with hope. I pray my story has spoken to your heart to teach you while albinos look different but are still part of God's enduring love filled with all races and colors sent to earth from heaven above. Wow. Time. I'm 52 years old and I still wouldn't get choked up, but I do. Because I think of children who are different, who are bullied in school, and my heart hurts for them or for anyone, regardless of age, who is different and who feel ostracized and who feel less than because of the way they're being treated by people. Thank you. And so we hope that this story ministered to your heart, that it helps children understand that. You are special. God made you perfect. Yes. You're perfect. To believe in yourself, to have confidence in yourself, to love yourself, to be kind to everyone. And for those people who aren't, you tell them that God made me special, that I'm unique. Mm -hmm. yes. That's the legacy that we all want to leave of this world. I, I sit here and I... Um, I remember hearing a, a man and his son talking and the gentleman, his father had reached a point where he needed help. And the son said to him, Dad, you know, it's amazing that you put diapers on me and now I put diapers on you. So I sat here and I listened to my daughter read this book. And I thought, what a blessing. I could not have done that as well as you did. So thank God for the light outside. <laughs> I, I thank him for the little things as well as the big things. And, uh, please forgive us. I have cried more since I have been a pastor and a father <laughs> and a teacher than I ever did before. I did not like people. <laughs> And it's amazing the person who did not like people, the person who sat in the back of the room has now come full front. I remember so vividly listening to um, one of the Kennedys speak at his brother's funeral. I believe it was Edward who spoke at Robert's funeral. And I remember him saying something along the line is, when he shall die, let them cast him out among the constellations and he shall shine so bright that all the other stars will be in him and that i believe was the impetus for the brightest star so thank you all so much and the book is available here as well as on amazon and please Take pictures, tell people about it, spread the word, spread the love. Amen. Any other questions? Thank you again for coming today. Very excited that we've had our inaugural event. Yes, here is their space. first event in their new space. Again, please, um, there's just a little form we'd like you to fill out so we know who's here today. It'll be at the, at the register. And just give us a couple moments. We'll get you uh, set up here so you can do the books and the signing. So just one moment. Yeah, but look around and, and you'll 